chapter 70. At the moment of the interdiction, when their eyes at length meet, what they believe they once found aboard the seahorse fails this time to appear. It is not a faltering on either man's part or the mistaken impression of one or any moral lapse. Tis a difference of opinion. Mason, stubborn, wishes to go on, believing that with Hugh Crawford's help, he may negotiate for another 10 minutes of arc. But Mason, they don't know what that is. We'll show them, let them look through the instruments or something, or they can watch us writing. They don't want any of that. They want to know how to stop this great invisible thing that comes crawling straight on over their lands, devouring all in its path. Well, of course, it's a living creature. Tis all of us, temporarily collected into an entity whose labours none could do alone. A tree-slaughtering animal with no purpose but to continue creating forever a perfect corridor over their land, its teeth of steel, its jaws axemen, its life's blood disbursement and what of its intentions beyond killing everything due west of it do you know i don't either then <clears throat> just just tidying these thoughts up a bit you're saying this line has a will to proceed westward what else are these people supposed to believe? Haven't we been saying with an hundred blades all day long? This is how far into your land we may strike. This is what we claim to westward. As you see what we may do to trees and how little we care. Imagine how little we care for Indians and what we are prepared to do to you. That influence you have felt along our line, that current strong as a river's, we command it. We might make through your nations an avenue of ruin, terrible as the path of a whirlwind. But those are threats we do not make, but might as well make as the Indians wish. We must go no further. No, we must go on. For 11 days, from the 9th through the 19th of October, they linger beside Dunkard Creek. The Indians, keeping their distance, looking to their weapons as to their routes of withdrawal, whilst the white folk dispute. Some of the hands are back east of here, cutting the visto to breadth as autumn closes in and everyone is eager to be away for there are other tasks that claim each in the party including the surveyors who at some point exchange positions with Dixon now for pushing on Razzle dazzling their way among the Indians at least as far as Ohio cheers the ticket let them have more than their daily ration of spirits. They'll be sports. Wait, you think you'll be getting through on charm? Indians all the way up into the Six Nations and down to the Cherokee know about that coat. Many have their eye upon it. And you are but the 
minor inconvenience from which it will have to be removed. The Indians grow coy and sinister. The women stare openly, steadily amused. Mason and Dixon are allowed to cross the warpath and three more turnings of Dunkard Creek before they can climb to a ridge top high enough to set up the sector. At last, the Dodmen have reached their western terminus. At 233 miles, 13 chains and 68 links from the post marked west. Damn, we're only a few miles shy. A few? Forty miles? Tis easy country. We're over the last ridge. We're in Ohio country. Mason has seen it from the top of Laurel Hill. The most delightful, pleasing view of the western plains the eye can behold. The paradise, once denied him by the mills, now denied him by, he supposes, British-American policy, ever devious. They travel, they decide to travel light and fast, not to take the sector, nor any other instrument. Mustn't tie that river in just yet. Aye. Let them all be free while they may. Mason is gothically depressive as Dixon is westeringly manic. Dixon's head, like a needle forever 90 degrees out, though it wobbles some, remains true to perfect west, whilst Mason might as well be riding backwards. So often does he look behind, certain that they are about to meet an abbreviation of Braddock's fate. Mason withal, via the happenstances of God's whimsy, is riding Creeping Nick, the same crazy animal that threw him onto the Jersey ice. Departing at sundown, keeping their latitude as best they may by Polaris, growing more fearful with every mile. They travel through the night, trans-terminal America whirling by, smelling of wild flowers and silt, and immediate lobes of honeysuckle scent apt to ambush the unwary nose. Amid moonlight, owls, smears of nocturnal colour somewhere off-centre in the field of vision. They make it to the great river just at dawn. The rush of the water loud as the sea. Stunned by the beauty of it, they forget. They linger. They overstay all practical time and are surprised by a party of Indians in elaborate paintwork. Far from your tents, red coat. It is Catfish and his nephew and some friends who reluctantly lower their rifles. Having a look at the river, sir, Dixon replies. There are Catawba parties about. Mingos, Seneca. Good thing we saw you first. How'd you sneak out past Hendricks? He never sleeps. Mason sees it first, then, tipped by his frozen silence, Dixon. Catfish is packing a Lancaster rifle, slung in a scabbard upon his saddle, with an inverted pentacle upon the stock, unmistakable in the moonlight. Mason looks over on the possibility that Dixon has a plan and sees Dixon already looking back at him upon the same deluded hope. Actually, says Dixon, we only just arrived, so it isn't as if we've seen the river, if that poses any sort of problem. And it 
certainly isn't as if we are planning to settle here. Catfish with one huge hand slides the rifle out and holds it up before him, noticing the steer loop as if for the first time. He smiles without mirth at the surveyors. You think this is my rifle? No, I took this rifle from a white man I have wished to meet for a long time. He was a very bad man. Even white people hated him. Beautiful piece, isn't it? The sign on it has evil powers, Mason warns. You should take a knife or something and pry it out. What happened to its owner? Dixon with a look of unsuccessfully feigned innocence. The Delaware is delighted to share that information with them. Pulling from a bag he carries a long lock of fair European hair, so freshly taken tis yet darkly adrip at one end with blood. This very day, my lords, had you been earlier, you might have met. Either Mason or Dixon might reply, we have met, yet neither does. It didn't feel complete to me, Mason admits later. I expected he yet lived, screaming about the woods, driven to revenge at any price. A monomaniac with a hole in the top of his head. Looking for that rifle back, adds Dixon. Coming back, setting in the last marks, crossing Jennings Run, Little Allegheny, Wills Creek, Wills Creek Mountain, the road up to Bedford, Everts Creek, Everts Mountain. At all the highest points in the Visto, they put up cairns, as the ancient British lay builders and dodsmen before them, as later the Romans, for purposes more legionary than commercial. The hands keep leaving without notice. With those who stay, the astronomers, Transiting from weightless obs to earthly back-wrenching toil, the obs demand, by way of expression, set posts every mile, these being large segments of tree, roughly squared, 12 by 12 inches, and five or sometimes even six feet long. First, the crew dig a deep post hole, put in the post, fill back the hole, tamping down the earth scientifically, one shovelful at a time, then bring more stone and earth to make a cone about the post, leaving perhaps six inches of it visible. That is the surveyor's estimate of the mark's longevity, though, of course, angles of repose vary, and with all, Mason and Dixon will bicker by now, over anything. On November 5th, two things happen at once. The Visto is completed, and the Indians depart. As if, as long as a tree remained, so might they. At last, the axemen have cleared the Visto back to the post, marking their last station of the year previous east of which all lies clear, all the way back to Delaware. There being one continued visto, Mason writes in the journal, opened in the true parallel from the intersection of the north line from the tangent point with the parallel to the ridge we left off at the 9th of October last. Mr. Hugh Crawford, 
with the Indians and all hands, except 13 kept to erect marks in the line, etc., left us in order to proceed home. The departing axemen roam about peering at, poking and buying blankets, kettles, milch cows, grindstones, anything Mo McLean thinks he may sell to lighten the load before the mountains. No offer too insulting. The venue is a protracted spectacle of sorrowful, sorrowful farewells, debts settled or evaded, whiskey jugs a swing upon every index and a squirrel staffata from the commissary tent without equal this side of the Allegheny Ridge. At length, the last of the farmers, new bought pots and pans a clank, goes riding off into a dusk rendered in copper plate, grey and black, the hatching too crowded to allow for any reversal or return, leaving gathered by the wagons, smoking pipes, grey with fatigue and winter skylight, Mr Barnes, Cope, Rob Farlow, the McLeans, Tom Hines, Boggs Jr., John and Ezekiel Kellogg, and the others of that faithful corps who stayed across Monongahela to the warrior path and the westernmost ridge and back again. None of the hands is feeling that well. Dixon has been giving out opiated filters to all who would but gesture toward their noses, as Mo McLean is writing at furious speed, chits upon Philadelphia money boxes as if he'll never see the place again. So what's it matter? Suddenly expenditures are above a hundred pounds, then two hundred pounds per week. Fiscal insanity has visited the commissary tent. Sensing opportunity, farmers with goods to sell appear from horizons all swear have been empty for hours. The snow drives in relentlessly. From the 9th to the 19th of November, another 11-day spin, there is little in the field book, suggesting either a passage so difficult that there was no time for nightly entries, or events so blameworthy on all sides that they were omitted from the account. In fact, such was the level of engagement required to answer the elements as to mark the line that there was no time for bad behaviour. This is the gradient of days in which the party must work their way up to the Allegheny crest, hastening as they may, the early winter having caught them west of the mountains. Here lie the most difficult miles of the long traverse, this ascent out of Ohio and out of the west, unsettled by the abrupt absence of Mohawks, with whom they have come to feel almost secure, as so seldom in this continent of hazard, the skies, night upon night, too clouded over for observations, both surveyors cast into perplexity, drink and play whist, for sums neither will ever see all in one place at the same time. The crew, meanwhile, deserting day upon day, their replacements taking ever more exorbitant wages. Yet, whilst they bide in this realm of the penny foolish and the pound idiotic, till the moment they must pass over the crest of the savage mountain, does there remain to them, contrary to reason, against the day, a measurable chance to turn, to go back out of no more than stubbornness and somehow make all come right. For once over the summit, they will belong again to the east, to Chesapeake, to lords for whom interests less subjunctive must ever enjoy priority. 
Though they have lost their race with the first snows, yet they pray they may get all the cans dug and piled before the ground freezes too hard. The snow is already a foot deep. Traces break. A wagon skids back down the slope on its side, the canvas bellying, the animals fearfully trying to fight clear. Tent poles and spades a clatter, a lantern against the low-lit day, falling and smashing upon the ice, tiny trails of flame borne instantly away. Here are the last cadre, out on the uninterrupted visto, from a certain height, oddly verminous upon the pale ribbon unfolding, fairly out in the hundred league current of Shah, where every step is purchased with a further surrender of ignorance as to what they have finished, what they have left at their backs undone, what measuring the degree of latitude next spring they shall be newly complicit in though if it takes them much longer to get over the ridge even if they escape freezing solid they may yet have journeyed further into terrestrial knowledge than will allow them to re-emerge without bargaining away too much for merely another return following another excursion in a cycle belonging to some engine whose higher assembly and indeed purpose they are never, except from infrequent glimpses, quite able to make out. Turned to retreat eastward again, watched from cover at every step, with apprehensions instead of lessening, rather mounting, ridge by ridge, the party feel the warrior path engrossing more of their sentimental horizon, even as it recedes into the west. Immediately upon the deaths of Baker and Carpenter begin a string of mishaps between men and trees, some nearly lethal, none unconnected. Felling mates try to keep as close as they may, often conversing more in a day than they have in all the time since they teamed up, spending precious minutes and daily rituals of protection. All pay tolls at the gates of sunrise, good but for the one day that must be got through. Mason and Dux Dixon look in again at the rabbi of Prague, inquiring in particular after Timothy Tox. He is mad, countrymen are soon explaining to them. What he now styles his golem does not exist. Mr Tox looks on with a tolerant smile. Because he heard it speak the same words as God out of the burning bush, Tim nowadays imagines himself Moses with a commission from God to bring another people out of captivity. Out of the city, declares Timothy Tox, where affliction ever reigns, must the golem deliver them over Shulkel out of that American Egypt. You don't want to be going into Philadelphia, lad, they warn him, carrying folk off and so forth, nor particularly confiding in too many of those sits about the golem now, for to many of them the old knowledge is a, an evil They'll be as content to execute ye for as lock ye away. I am quite undeluded, the forest dithyrambist replies. As to the Philadelphians, before all the lawyers, come, come, does no one recall? Tis only by the grace that some call luck that anyone can quite escape the muck as e'er amongst wax and wigs and printer's ink seepeth 
the creeping sly suborners stink. There he goes. So do you do ye summon it, Tim. We're on to, to that by now. It will protect me, as it will protect them it sets free. Twas never your creature to command, Tim. Just so, it is our guardian. Mason and Dixon, each revisiting the rabbi of Prague for his distinct reasons, attend this discussion closely. Dixon has already proposed offering Mr. Tox the protection of the party as far as Newark, near the tangent point. So long as he doesn't bring the golem, stipulates Mason. He brings the golem, well, what do they eat, for example? What are their sanitary requirements? How shall Mo McLean, who's already striking himself daily upon the pate with his own ledgers, find the additional resources? Yet, mightn't we turn the creature to some useful work, say upon the visto, pulling up the trees by their roots, clearing out all those unsightly stumps. The axemen would never hear of it. Next two-story house we came to would both be taken upstairs and defenestrated. Nay, I know what you seek. The neighbourhood of prodigy, the mobility awestruck, entry to saloons you have previously been unwelcome in. Whilst Mason himself, of course, is angling quite a different stream. Here is a creature made of water and earth. Clay, that is, and minerals. As if an Indian mound of the west, struck by lightning, had risen, stood, and newly awakened with the fiz vulgaris surging among all its precisely fashioned laminae, begun purposefully to walk. An American wonder, one's own witness of which might even be brought back across the cold sea to the true terminable world again. Mason can think of no way to ask the obvious question, as he did of the learned dog, and has been reluctant to of the Frenchman's duck. Now, with all time for this grows short, just outside in the forest, articulate as drumming, can be heard the rhythmic approach of the cabalistic colossus Mr. Tox has summoned. Mason and Dixon place their heads upon the table and regard each other solemnly, in joint awareness of how much effort will be, le will be needed this time to believe Mr. Tox's testimony as to whatever is about to appear. As twill prove, the closer they escort Mr. Tox to the metropolis, the less evidence for the creature's existence will they be given. Till at length they must believe that the poet has either passed, like some Indian youth at the onset of manhood, under the protection of a potent, though invisible spirit, or gone mad. They leave him upon the Newcastle Road, standing among, among the late purple loose strife by the ditch, glancing upward from time to time, waving his arm, then growing still, appearing to listen. Just before he has dwindled round the last bend in their own road, Mason and Dixon see a Conestoga wagon with an exceptionally bright canopy and drawn by matched white horses, stop beside him. Timothy Tox, without hesitation, goes round to the tailgate and climbs up under the luminous canvas, vanishing within, as if confident that the golem, whose strides are at least as long as a team and wagon, will contrive to stay close to him, wherever he is taken, and whatever may befall him there. End of chapter.